Hello everybody, welcome. My name's Noah Aloha. Thank you for joining me. Uh, we are back playing Arkham Horror the Card Game. And finally, we are moving into Chapter 2. Uh, we are not playing Scenario 1. Uh, we're actually going to have a go at Scenario 2, The Midnight Masks. And yes, we are continuing our full playthrough of the Corsets main campaign. Take a look at the table. Um, there's a bunch of setup involved with the second chapter. As you can see, it's much more complicated setup than the gathering. There are nine locations. Uh, we still have to finish off setup. There are a couple of things we have to do. And the cards that you place as locations are all connected in specific ways, but this essentially is a map of Arkham. Uh, if we start in, well, we'll start with our house down here. Uh, because we did not burn our house down at the end of scenario one, our house is uh, standing in Arkham, and this is where we will begin scenario two. Uh, the house is connected to what's um, basically the central location in Arkham, Rivertown. You can see it even has the trait central there in the center, and there's a card or two which reference that. Um, Rivertown is connected to five other of the location cards. You can note that there are five paths that I've scribbled onto the board. Uh, one of them is the graveyard over here, which has this single access point. You could then go down, say, to Southside, uh, across to St. Mary's Hospital. We have Miskatonic University over here. Northside in the top corner there. Downtown and East Town. You may also note that I have spawned an Acolyte on Southside. This is indicated in the scenario setup for Chapter 2, and this is due to us having a two-investigator game. In a one-investigator game, this Acolyte does not spawn. I think in a three-investigator game, you have an Acolyte spawn here, and an Acolyte up in downtown, that kind of thing. Text on the Acolyte. It is a humanoid, it is a cultist. 3-1-2 for stats. When you draw it from the encounter deck, uh, you will have to spawn it at any empty location. The investigator would choose. And it has forced text. Once it enters play, uh, you place one doom on it. That enters play part there does include this initial setup stage. So I've placed a doom token on there. And as uh, a result, our doom track is already at one. If we can get to the acolyte and defeat it, then we can remove the doom token and reduce this down by one. So we're probably going to head to the south side location first of all. And there's another reason I would like to head down to south side, even if it is a 50-50 uh, coin flip type of opportunity. Uh, you will note here, um, I hope, uh, this has no number on it, whereas this has two, because there are two cards here. Uh, they are both south side, but they have different um, backs, they have different text on the rear. There are two actual parts of Southside that you can uh, have in your scenario. So I'm going to shuffle these around and I'm going to remove this one. I'm not going to look at the back. So this is one of the two Southside cards and I do not know which. Similarly, you do the same for Downtown. I will shuffle these up and remove one of them from the game. Uh, that is pretty much how you set up Scenario 2. Uh, the, the campaign log in, suggests that you have it in a very strict kind of square, so three at the top, three in the middle, three at the bottom. <laughs> I don't know whether this is better or worse, um, but seeing as I have the advantage of being able to draw on my table, I thought it might be nice to give it more of a natural um, look. So it's a little bit random, rather than just being a three by three grid. Um, we've gone for something just a little bit more city-like, perhaps, with a little winding trail leading to the spooky graveyard. Anything else we need to discuss? Of course, we have upgraded our decks. We have complete decks here. 33 cards. Note, if we had chosen, if through uh, a, another resolution, we would have taken Lita uh, for the lead investigator. Roland would have been allowed to add Lita to his deck. Uh, he would have 34 cards in here. It gets added to the lead investigator's deck if you manage to acquire it, or choose to acquire it, rather. Um, and it doesn't count as your deck limit, so you would actually have a, a deck of 34 uh, if you had acquired Lita. So let's and actually go over to the sideboard first. Let's um, show what cards I have removed. 
So for Roland, I have removed his copy of Beat Cop. This has been upgraded. I have removed his copy of Old Book of Law. This one has been replaced. And I have removed his copy of Mind Over Matter. This has been replaced. Wendy, I have removed her Switchblade, and this has been replaced. I have removed Lucky, which has been upgraded. And I have removed a Leo De Luca, which has been upgraded. So if we remember the actual in, uh, victory points that we acquired, um, at the end it totaled up to Roland having seven experience points to spend, and Wendy having six experience points to spend, I have used all points. So going into scenario two, or rather going into scenario three, I suppose, um, we will have no leftover experience points that we can apply. So I've just put zeros down there. And what did we add? Uh, let's take a look at Wendy first. As I mentioned, we have upgraded Lucky. So the new Lucky card, it costs, if you note the two little pips um, up in the top left there, where it has cost one, those two little pips indicate the two experience points that I had, I had to spend. Um, it's very similar to Lucky, as you would expect with a straight upgrade. However, um, now when we add plus two to a skill value test, the Lucky card replaces itself. I also get to draw a card. Uh, if we can combo this with Wendy's Amulet, it's just really maximizing the effect. Lucky's a great card. I have upgraded Leo De Luca uh, for one experience point, and the only difference here is that rather than it costing six resources, it now only costs five resources. Other than that, it's exactly the same. And we added a new event for um, three experience points, Will to Survive. It is a fast card, so it will not take an action to play. We can only play it during our turn, so during Wendy's three actions, that window. Up until the end of your turn, do not reveal any chaos tokens for any skill tests you perform. So it allows you to just um, control. It's a control card, essentially. It allows you to know exactly what you can and cannot do. There is no randomness applied from the chaos bag. So with a bit of preparation, if you know you have cards that you can commit to get to the values you need to be at, um, it's, a, it's just a nice control card, similar to something like Cunning Distraction, which I also consider a control card. So if we add, just add these up, three victory points, uh, three experience points, two experience points, one experience point totals these six that Wendy had to spend. For Roland, I, I wanted, because of Roland's 9-5 stats, I do like taking Elder Sign Amulet. It's expensive though at three experience points, but it gives him, um, it goes in his, what's the word, accessory slot, and it just gives him a nice four sanity that he can just keep dropping on here. It um, really strengthens his survivability. However, I, because we didn't take any trauma in scenario one, and I feel okay-ish at five, maybe, <laughs> um, I have opted not to take the Elder Sign Amulet. We have added, let's go from this side first. No, let's do Beat Cop first. We have upgraded Beat Cop to two experience points. Still four cost. The difference here is um, the extra ability that it has underneath its permanent plus one combat. Uh, rather than a discard to deal one damage to an enemy at our location, we can, as a during a free trigger window, exhaust this card deal a damage to it, and then deal damage to an enemy at your location. So if we're not putting damage on here, say we just use this to soak up one sanity, we can, in three, over the course of three uh, turns, three rounds, because it's exhausted, you can, in the free trigger windows, just ping a single damage onto enemies. Um, obviously after the third, it will have been dealt three damage, and at that point you would have to discard it. Um, just makes it a nice versatile card. I think the three two stats at the bottom, I think that is an upgrade also. Let me just come check that. I should know this already. I think beat cop is two two. Yes. The default beat cop is two two. It's also gone up to three two. So it's a nice upgrade. The other two cards that we added is shotgun, which is just a monstrous weapon. However, it only has two ammo. It gives you plus three to your combat. Roland already has a high combat, and instead of dealing a fixed amount of damage, you are comparing the final check and if the amount that you go over the difficulty is the amount of damage that you do. So 
say for example if we apply it to something like the ghoul priest which we know has a difficulty of four and um, we might get up to let's say we pumped our combat so we were at eight and then we drew a minus one we would go down to a value of seven and then you'd compare the seven versus the four it would do three damage it has two ammo i mean it's expensive at five cost but it can if I st uh, as long as you don't get some really bad chaos token pulls it can do some just disgusting damage to mitigate somewhat the two ammo also just as a way to um, replenish if we don't draw into shotgun or we can't afford shotgun just as a way to replenish the various firearms that Roland uses uh, we have extra ammunition also which allows us to play it for two resources and then we can place three ammo tokens on any firearm so Roland's special 38 is regular-ish handgun and also shotgun would all be applicable there and that comes to one experience point two three experience points and then plus four seven experience points so that's our deck and by and large we're ready to get started um, we can read some flavor text to get us started you would pick a specific depending on how the scenario one ended you get to pick or not pick you are um, pointed towards a certain uh, opening piece of flavor text so if uh, where is it see you here right then no, before we do this, one more thing just to um, check for the uh, the new chapter, rather, before we jump into flavor and get to drawing cards. Everything else is pretty much the same, but because we're on a new chapter, we do have a new set of token um, meanings. The symbol tokens are not going to be the same as they were in the gathering. So let's take a look at what they are in the Midnight Masks on Easy or Standard. Now, any skull token, of which there are two in the bag, so one in eight, is minus X, where in this case, X is the highest number of doom on any single cultist that is in play. So it could be zero if you are clearing cultists. Um, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, I think it's more likely than in the gathering that the skulls are minus one, perhaps. They can, it can be an ev a really nasty minus if you get some certain encounter cards but yes um it's very usually this is a zero modifier in the gathering it's not going to be zero as often i think in the midnight masks the cultist token corresponds to a minus two whereas it was minus one in the gathering it's a minus two modifier and it has a fixed effect of place one doom on the nearest cultist enemy um, obviously there would need to be an enemy for us to place it on if there's no enemies we don't have to do it and if we have cultists who are equidistant away, the lead investigator would choose. The broken runestone, or the broken tablet icon in this, is actually a minus three, which is nasty. And it has an if you fail qualifier. Um, place one of your clues on your location. Ouch. So that's what we're playing with there. Nothing else to discuss, I think. I think we're good to go now. Yeah. Let's uh, read some flavor text. Part 2. The Midnight Masks In the wake of the disaster at your home, Lita Chandler, the red-haired woman from your parlour, lays out a tale that, even in light of what you have just witnessed, strains the limits of your belief. The creatures in your home, she claims, are called ghouls, cruel beings who plague the crypts, caverns and tunnels beneath the city of Arkham. These creatures feed on the corpses of humans, and they have served, and they, <laughs> these creatures feed on the corpses of humans, and they are served by a dark cult within Arkham, whose members have inexplicably come to worship the ancient master of the ghouls. This cult has been killing innocent people and feeding them to the ghouls, satiating a monstrous hunger. A dark balance was maintained until now. Recently, Lita continues, one of their lairs where the corpses were stored was destroyed. Since then, the ghouls have been more active than usual. I have tracked their movements and tried my best to stop them from running amok throughout the city, but I think there is something worse going on. The cult has been planning something darker and more ominous than anything I have yet observed. 
Indications are that this plan shall come to fruition tonight, shortly after midnight. Beyond that, I cannot fathom what to expect. Many of the cultists, Lita continues, will seem like everyday people, despite their foul intentions. Whenever the cult meets, its members don masks shaped like the skulls of various animals to protect their identities from one another. Though these masks are our mark, symbols of death and decay. We must unmask the cultists to expose and derail their plans. We have but a few hours. The more cultists we find before midnight, the better. There we have it. Leto is explaining that we need to find cultists, as many as we can. There is no more setup that I need to do at this point, I think. Now we're good. The ghoul priest is defeated. Otherwise, we would be throwing him into our encounter deck. That's no good. But we're, luckily, we defeated the ghoul priest, so he's not going to pop up in our tale anymore. Right then. Before we jump into reading the agenda and the act, let's draw some cards. Okay. We have a weapon. We can keep machete at this point, I think. We want to draw into something a little bit stronger. Um, ideally before the first agenda flips. I think we keep flashlight. I don't think we keep physical training. I'm going to keep unexpected courage. Um, and I'm pretty much going to keep this solely in case I draw into a certain encounter card that has me test agility. Um, it can have quite a nasty effect depending on circumstances. Uh, I won't say what it is just yet because this may be the first experience some of you have with the this certain chapter, but let's just say I might want to pass an agility test at some point. Um, overpower might be worth keeping if only for an event that happens when we flip the first agenda. Hmm. Unsure. We do have two of these in the deck. No, we're going to get rid of it and hope that we draw into one, perhaps. We'll keep the machete. We'll keep the unexpected courage. We'll keep the flashlight. Let's see what uh, we can replace these two with. There is a guts. And a knife. Not superb. Um, I may even, at this point... I don't know how to handle this, actually. Uh, Crypt Chill makes its triumphant return. Um, or not exactly a return, because um, it never went away. Uh, Crypt Chill will be in this uh, scenario also, so I still have my worries about just throwing my machete out on its own. Um, we run into an unlucky Crypt Chill, we would have to discard our machete, most likely. So I need to consider how we will... Uh, mitigate the, the possibility of that. Obviously, one hand slot, one hand slot, one hand slot. It might be worth, perhaps, early on, just equipping the machete and the knife, and then we can perhaps discard the knife at some point to make room for flashlight, and in the interim, whilst knife is out, try to focus on low shroud locations. Once knife is gone, or if I feel like I need to move into a high shroud, at that point I can perhaps drop the flashlight um, in that hand. We'll see. Wendy. Another Leo de Luca would be uh, wonderful. We can manage that. There's Wendy's amulet. I am going to discard, uh, when, not discard, mulligan out um, that for similar reasons to previous. I would like to have it in the mid game. Um, I don't want to have it in my hand. I don't want to play it until we have established uh, a healthy little discard of events. Hmm, we'll keep a perception for clue grabbing, maybe. Actually, no, because I have a plan of what I want to do with Wendy, and it doesn't necessarily involve perception. Yeah, I, I think we actually discard perception in this instance, even though clue grabbing is incredibly important. Um, I think we can get rid of it at this point. Yeah, 
Yeah. Do I want to have her equipped with knife? Curious option. We do have things like these acolytes. Um, so were we to equip knife and use the discard option, we would get plus two combat. So we would go up to three versus an acolyte. We would be zeros or better to actually defeat it. And obviously we would have her repulse. I don't know actually. I don't know if... I think Wendy... I mean, baseball bat would be much, much better. But I think it's just a cheap asset. Yeah, I'm going to get rid of hard knocks. And Wendy's amulet. I'm mulliganing a little bit heavy here in the hopes that we can again draw into an early Leo de Luca. We can again click for a res... Oh, it, would, it actually costs five resources now, so we wouldn't need to click for the extra resource. I'm going to keep... Do I want to keep elusive? Um, it's a nice way to get out of a, um, a location without spending the evade action. And it classes as a movement into some other location. However, I think it comes into its own as an event when you have multiple enemies mobbed up on you. So with that in mind, I'm not going to keep it in the opening hand. We'll keep our knife. We're drawn into good old Derringer that did some work in uh, The Gathering, the first chapter, even though I dislike it. I'm not liking the hand <laughs> that we are drawing into. So we can't have amnesia because it's our weakness. No, not great. We'll get Stray Cat out. Um, cunning Distraction, not too useful, to be honest. I don't know if I will... We'll see what happens in the, in the chapter, obviously. But uh, circumstances I found in Chapter 2, it's not necessarily a chapter where you find yourself getting mobbed by enemies at any point. Emergency Cache is nice. Derringer, hmm... Yeah, I don't know what to do about these. I think maybe we... We have to decide between whether we want to equip the knife or the derringer. I might just go with knife, um, just to save on resources. I don't know. Not great opening hands, therefore, either of them, I would say. But we make do with what we do. Um, an opening strategy here, then, is going to be for both investigators to make a beeline for south side um, on the off chance, the 50-50 chance that this is a certain card that allows me to do a certain cool thing uh, which we will discuss once we get to south side at that point I'm going to be sending Wendy over to the graveyard because um, she is best equipped to deal with this area outside of that we're just going to play it by ear and based on circumstances right then let us check out our Agenda and Act text. Agenda 1. Predator or Prey. Lita seems convinced of a conspiracy within the city of Arkham. She believes that a secret cult serves the ghouls that live in the crypts beneath the city and that several of the cult's prominent members are scattered throughout Arkham. As you begin searching for them, you can't shake the feeling that you, too, are being hunted. So, we have a permanent agenda action, so we do not have to be in a specific location. At any point, an investigator can spend an action and resign, um, essentially ending their contribution to this chapter. And we have a doom tick of six. When that reaches six, something bad is going to happen. Act one, uncovering the conspiracy. You have one night to find the members of this cult and unveil their plan. The more members of the cult you can find and interrogate before midnight, the better. As an action, again based on the act, so you don't have to be at a specific location, the investigators spend two clues per investigator as a group. Draw the top card of the cultist deck. Oh, of course, I never mentioned the cultist deck. We'll get to that in a second. So, two clues per investigator. We would need to, as a group, spend four clues, and then we get to draw the top card of the cultist deck. Our objective right now is, well, our objective, full stop, period, 
Find as many unique cultist enemies as you can and add them to the victory display. If there are six unique cultist enemies in the victory display, advance. So for us to actually, um, for want of a better term, win this act, we would need all six unique cultists. However, that's not the goal here. It is very, very difficult to gain all six unique cultists. Note, first of all, this is a cultist and it is not unique in the sense of the text that we just read because it does not have the asterisk next to the name Acolyte. There is another cultist type in this encounter deck and I think there's only one of them. So you could argue, well, this is a unique cultist because there's only one of them in the deck. It is not classed as a unique cultist. It is essentially like named characters. Uh, the same way that uh, we don't have one. Uh, Leo De Luca, uh, Dr. Milan, Christopher, they have asterisks next to their name. Uh, they are unique cards. You can only have one of them on the board at the time. Um, we are going to aim to get four cultists, I think is a nice um, target. Uh, once we have four cultists, we will um, take a look at the board state and decide whether we want to um, jump out and resign or whether we feel we can maybe grab a fifth Gosh, even a sixth if we're doing ex exceptionally well. But four is what I'm going for. Uh, you may also note that there is no two or three as I hover over this card. There is just a single act card here. There are two agenda cards. We are going to flip this, something's going to happen, and then we will have a second agenda under here. So just to recap, we are going to try and find four unique cultists, and we are going to try to do that as fast as possible before we suffer the effects of the agenda. Um, I'm not going to try to defeat this act. I'm just going to try to do my best and maximize our chances going into the third scenario. So um, it mentions the cultist deck. That's this here. There are five cards in the game. Um, I'm not going to show them yet, but in here are five unique enemies and they are all cultist types. Uh, you may also have noted that um, it says at the bottom there, not all six of them are in the cultist deck makes sense because there's only five here. There is another unique cultist floating around somewhere. Uh, so we would spend four clues, pull this off the top, and then follow the instructions on the card. Other than that, the game is going to run exactly as we are used to. Okay, that is enough prep, enough explanation. Let's jump in. Right, we begin at Roland's house because uh, it is still standing read the flavor text on the house. Despite what happened, you just couldn't bring yourself to destroy your home. Okay, our house now has a shroud value of two and it is its own single location card. Uh, it spawns two clues on here, one per investigator, and it has forced text. Uh, when the ghoul priest spawns, spawn it here instead of its normal location. We don't need to worry about that because we defeated the ghoul priest. As an action, when you are here, you may draw one card and gain one resource, and that is limited to once per turn. That is per investigator. Um, so we could hang out here, and uh, in terms of action efficiency, instead of uh, an action costing, uh, an action gaining us one card or an action gaining us one resource, we could double up on that, spend one action and get both. We don't want to hang around too fast. Um, this is a fast scenario in terms of racing against this. Uh, you cannot dally too much. You cannot just hang around and um, build up uh, your strength, um, similar to how you perhaps can in scenario one. You really need to get a move on and be as efficient as possible with your actions. We may throw um, a single action at this just to get um, one card, one resource, just to give us a little bit of a boost, but then we are gonna head in. Um, I may not actually even do that. Um, Seems we have clues on here. I think it makes sense to take advantage of us not burning down the house um, using that action and also grabbing these relatively low shroud clues. Um, as a reward type effect, I kind of would prefer the house to have a shroud value of one um, to make these easy clues. Um, with a shroud value of two, they're kind of middling difficulty clues. So that is where we are. Who shall go first? I do not know. Uh, one thing I am going to do just now whilst I am, I'm going to just copy these and I'm going to paste them over there and we will get to a situation where I'll explain why I've done that uh, shortly. 
Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I think. Who has a hand which I know I'm going to. Where I know what I'm going to do with it? Nobody. No. I think what we will do is. In terms of. So let's say Roland wants to go down here and kill this. There's not necessarily too much of a hurry for Roland to do so. Um, it has one Doom on it, but that Doom will only be relevant uh, when this is at 5, say. Because um, then it would tick up to 6, and that would cause this to advance. As long as we get here before this hits 5, we can bring it back down and gain ourselves a turn. However, the um, impact of having Doom over here does have an impact on several of these over here. So it would correspond to a minus one modifier for any skull tokens. But there are definitely benefits to getting rid of this. I'm wondering whether Roland spends an action here and then moves. Spends an action here, equips a machete moves and moves. He wouldn't be able to combat this turn. So let's aim to have Roland defeating this Acolyte on the second turn. With that in mind, Roland will go first and he will equip a machete. He will then spend an action on the clue text here. Uh, not the clue text, I was thinking of clues at that point. On the card text, rather. Gain a card and gain a resource. Uh, what card do we draw into? Physical training. I hope I shuffled these um, after returning them to the deck. I think I did. I usually do, um, but I know we had this in our opening mulligan. Um, but yes, yeah, sure, we have an extra card. As a third action, should I... Try to grab a clue from here? Or should I leave that up to Wendy? I think we try to grab the clue. As a third action, we will investigate using intellect 3 versus shroud value 2 and hope that we get a minus 1 or better. That is a skull icon, which at the moment is a minus 1, so we are successful. Roland gains a clue. Wendy then. I think Wendy's first action will be to use the card ability. She will gain a resource and draw a card. We have a flashlight. Let's see. At this point, then, I think Wendy will spend an action to equip Stray Cat, and then she will spend an action attempting to gain this clue. Same test. Minus one or better. That is minus three. Do I want to, in a bid to just leaving this location and not returning, do I want to discard anything? I think I do. And I think I'm going to, as questionable as this might be, I think I am going to discard the 41 Derringer. Yeah, I'm going to discard that and re-pull this token. That is another skull icon, corresponds to minus one. We are successful and we have this clue. So, actions are complete. There are enemies on the board, but they don't do anything. And we go into upkeep. Nothing to unexhaust. So Roland will gain a card, gain a resource. Wendy will gain a card, gain a resource. So you drew into manual dexterity, could be useful. Scotland drew into a perception, which mm, could be usefulish at some point. I mean, it will be useful at some point. 
Um, the locations we're going to be travelling to aren't necessarily particularly high shroud. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. We want to be getting four clues as quickly as possible so that we can immediately grab one of these and see where it spawns. Okay, we're into the, first uh, the second turn. End of the first turn and going into turn two. We will pip this up by one and we will draw a card for Roland. He has drawn Hunting Shadow. Peril. Peril means when you draw it, you do not get to converse with any other people that you are playing with. You have to make this decision on your own. You cannot even tell them that you have this card. Uh, as a revelation effect, you must either spend a clue or take two damage. At this point, with Roland being 9-5, I'm going to take two damage and keep the clue. That is how important clues are to quickly moving through this scenario. I'm not saying that's the correct option, um, but that is how I have been treating speed as a priority. Um, health is a resource. Health is a resource. Uh, Wendy, what have you got? We have an enemy. It's another acolyte, but we have to spawn it on an empty location. So that's actually fairly easy. We will spawn this in the... River Town. Actually, there is something to be said for. Is there something to be said for? No, actually, arguably not. I think. I think. Hmm. Hmm. Now, I think we place it on the hospital. Yeah, sure, the hospital's fine. Um, we'll place another Doom on here. Whoops. And ticks up by one more. Uh, Roland will probably go around here. Um, he has a reason for visiting the hospital. Right then. So, that is our current situation going into the next lot of actions. We can pretty much leave the house and forget about it now. Assuming we don't spawn any acolytes over here, which we probably won't do. So who shall go first? Uh, I would like Roland to come into here first so that he can he will get the engagement of the acolyte and he can um, use his machete. So Roland will go first. He is going to move he will also figure out for me which copy of Southside this is, uh, and then I can uh, determine whether I want Wendy to head in that direction. He's going to move into Rivertown. Let's take a look at Rivertown first. The banks of the Miskatonic River are lined with docks, warehouses, and small shops in a district aptly named Rivertown. We flip it. We see it has a shroud value of one, fairly easy, and it is uh, a one per investigator for clues, so we can drop two clues here. I am not going to keep Roland in this area. He is going to head on with his second action toward Southside. Take a look at Southside. Middle class houses with gambrel roofs crowd together between the streets of Southside. The neighborhood is known for its cultural and social landmarks, such as South Church, Mars Boarding House, and the Historical Society. We want Mars Boarding House. Let's see which one we have. Hurrah! So, I like this location. As an action, we may search our deck for any ally asset and add it to our hand. This is nice for getting out something like Dr. Milan Christopher or Beat Cop for Roland. It is also especially nice for Wendy so that she can just grab Leo De Luca and maximize uh, the benefits of his fourth action that he grants her. Okay, so with that in play, Wendy is going to head down here and tutor up um, Leo De Luca. That was Roland's second action. Well, let's finish what we're doing. Put some clues on here and note that it has two shroud. Uh, as a third action, Roland is going to smack the acolyte. Should already have done this. As soon as he entered the area, I should have placed this in his threat area. And then as a third action, Roland is going to um, swing his machete at the cultist's 
silly face. Let's see how we do. Combat 4, Combat 5, versus difficulty 3, and it will do... Well, it only has 1 damage, so the plus 1 damage isn't actually so important. Right then. We want minus 2 or better, please. Oh dear. So, we fail. Minus 4. It's not going to cut it. Uh, when uh, Roland will actually take probably an attack in the enemy phase here, because I don't think... I don't think Wendy... Ah, uh, no, no, no. He'll take the enemy attack. That's no problem, actually. I don't mind doing that. Right then, Wendy, what shall you do? So you also shall spend an action to move, spend a second action to move, and a third action to utilize the um, special ability here. And I'm going to search her deck for Leo. What? I am going to add it to our hand. Note that this is now five cost. And obviously we give this a shuffle now. That was Wendy's three actions. And next turn she is ready to she has the resources to pay for this, and she can start maximizing her um, action, her four actions. So that is the end of this phase. Uh, we go into the enemy phase. Roland has a readied enemy in his area, which is going to deal one damage to him. We go into upkeep and draw some cards. Roland draws into an overpower. That's actually, we're getting to a point now where, sure, I want to have an overpower in my hand uh, for a certain event that will happen at some point. We can go over to Wendy. And she's drawn into Baseball Bat. That's very nice. I'm very happy to have drawn into that. It does mean that if we equip Baseball Bat, we are losing out on the ability to equip Flashlight. I mean, given the... I don't actually know. I don't know how useful Baseball Bat is in this scenario, arguably. In the sense, if it negates your ability to equip flashlight, it might be worth us going somewhere trying to equip flashlight, um, use up its three charges, and then go into baseball bat. That might be the better option. We're filling our hand up here. We have to be careful of the weakness. And um, yeah, there's no reason not to spend some of these, uh, especially once we get Leo out and we get that extra action. Uh, we do get another resource, and that is the end of this turn. I will uh, put a cut in here, and we can come back and smash some cultists, and then Wendy may go and take a look at the... Actually, no, maybe she won't. Wendy may go somewhere with a higher shroud value than the, the graveyard. We'll see. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Thank you for watching. Um, Drop a note if you are uh, if you spotted anything that I did wrong. I think that was fairly clean, and I will uh, see you again in the next video where we continue our playthrough of the campaign and this specific playthrough, our first on video of Chapter Two: The Midnight Masks. See you soon. Bye bye.